gemash saad. And we're back for part two of our conversation with Prince Yoel and his lovely wife, Ariana. I started off by asking the question, what lasting impacts did this young prince want to achieve? This is how we started this conversation. Stick around. Obviously, as we were talking earlier, the legacy that I'm trying to carry forward uh, always stems from my family background history. Uh, Emperor Haile Selassie himself was a big champion for education. And uh, I also am a strong believer to, uh, on, about mm. education. And so those, those are kind of the charities that I've um, gravitated towards. Uh, with an uncle of mine a few years back, uh, he was a big um, entrepreneur and businessman in the UK and he decided to come back to Ethiopia to start a charity for entrepreneurship for young people uh, around the country. And so um, I decided to join him and work with him. And mm -hmm. uh, really at the focus of that, I find that education is the key to the future for our youth. Absolutely. And so that's, that's kind of my approach to that. Nelson Mandela once famously remarked, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world around you. This belief that an investment in knowledge yields the highest returns rings true in every sense. I deeply admire Prince Yoel for placing himself at the vanguard of educational endeavors. The mark of a truly great African leader lies not just in his present achievements, but in his commitment to the next generation. By investing in the children of today, we nurture the architects of tomorrow's society, a society that will resonate with the echoes of his legacy, contributing to our nation's eternal glory, one generation at a time. So I think for me, it's a, a couple of things. One is that um, I worked in philanthropy. So I worked for Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors for several years. Um, and as part of that work, I, gave money and, and funds to different kinds of storytellers mm -hmm. in the US. And then now I'm doing a fund that's focused on the diaspora. So it kind of ties in with all our, mm -hmm. you know, personal and professional things. Um, and then in a separate way, I actually over the weekend was at an organization called Studio Samwell, which is a NGO here in Addis, um, which I just joined as Goodwill Ambassador. And it's basically a program that supports girls in Ethiopia ages nine to 18. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, you know, they kind of approached me and it was kind of a perfect fit um, to be supporting young women in pursuing their education and business opportunities. So that's one that I'm really excited about that I just, just joined. In the realm of community service and philanthropy, Ariana has consistently been a pivotal figure in this area. Her involvement in giving back to the community is not just a recent endeavor, but a long-standing part of her narrative. Beyond their philanthropic and community commitments, Yoel and Ariana channel their energies into celebrating and amplifying positive black narratives. They founded Wax and Gold, a production company based out of Los Angeles. This venture is more than just a business. It's a platform dedicated to empowering the next generation of storytellers, providing them with the resources and support needed to bring their unique and uplifting stories to the forefront. So we wanted to take inspiration uh, from the Ethiopian literary device, which is Wax and Gold, uh, where any story or, or words or have a meaning that is superficial, uh, that's the wax, it can melt away. Mm -hmm. And then what reveals is the gold, and the gold is the truer, deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to name our company that because that's essentially uh, the approach we are um, taking with all of these film and TV projects that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to talk about stories that are universal, um, that you know may on a surface level just talk about certain topics that are obvious, but mm -hmm. really more deeply, we want to have stories of power coming out of Africa, out of Ethiopia, out of the diaspora. Uh, because we feel like a lot of the stories that are told, especially the ones that are financed and, and distributed all over the world about Africa are usually uh, very negative or, or you know, are, are really just talking about the challenges and the adversity that we have. Um, and our mission is that those are the surface level issues. More deeply, if we look, we've had tremendous uh, uh, leaders and, and, and a tremendous rich history in Africa and we're starting with Ethiopia. And so Wax and Gold is supposed to capture that in the name of the company, but also the message of all of our 
um, uh, films and, and media that you will see will carry that message within it too. What we have really focused on are, is really captured in our mission statement of the company, which is powerful black stories that inspire global audiences. And we used the word black on purpose so that it's inclusive of Africans, people in the African diaspora, and so that we have a sense of a, a shared destiny because we have a shared history. Mm -hmm. And so all of our stories that we want to tell are gonna carry that message that we're stronger together, we're united, we have a shared history, we have a shared destiny, we can do this together and do it better together. The first thing I'll say to the audience is please, as we uh, uh, join us on this journey, uh, you know, spread the word when, when, when our, our projects come out. Um, and in return, obviously also reach out to us, tell us about your ideas. We want stories that will empower and inspire. The kind of films like, the example that comes to mind would be Black Panther, right? Everybody watched it, everybody dressed up in their African outfit, whether you're from the Caribbean, from your African-American, your African expat in the Europe, uh, people in Africa. Uh, it felt like a moment coming together. But Black Panther is a, is a fictional country, right? Uh, and so we don't want to leave it there because we don't want to leave the impression that we don't have these real stories. And so we encourage you, if you are listening now, uh, to reach out to us. Uh, we love stories that, you know, we're not going to ignore the adversity. We have a lot of challenges in Africa and even in our history, we have a lot of problems. But everybody in the world has problems. What we have to do is be ambassadors for ourselves and tell ourselves how great we are and tell the world how great we are. So we love stories that focus on great leaders or stories that touch your heart and give you full of hope uh, and that have to do with Africa. And so, you know, we can have adversity throughout the story, but we love the stories that end in victory where you've overcome, because that's how, what we've done as African people all over the world. Yes, we've gone through a lot of problems, but we always overcome. We're here and we're here to stay. And the future is Africa. So reach out to us. And now, guess what? They're poised to unveil a story that is both close to their hearts and rooted in reality. Here's a hint. It's truly based on a real life story. Recall their captivating New York Times article about their serendipitous meeting we mentioned earlier, blossoming love and eventual marriage? Well, that very same narrative is set to be transformed into a movie by a major Hollywood production company. This could be a landmark moment for Wax and Gold, marking their first ever major project, bringing their own enchanting love story to life on the big screen. Tell us the name of your the one the working title because I love it and <laughs> <laughs> I love the name if of, it's not too no of love, love story love, love rain rains on the superficial level it would be love rains as in love reigns supreme you know the expression about how love conquers all mm -hmm. uh, but then obviously the, on on the surface that's what the name is but uh, it also speaks to us as royals in that Royal. sense mm -hmm. and uh, it, this is our opportunity to present black royals to the world. And so I think that through our uh, New York Times article, um, I think we were very proud in the way we were able to represent black royalty. Mm -hmm. And we want to do that again uh, in this film. So that's going to be probably our very first project that we'll start with. Mm -hmm. But it inspired us to continue and, and, and uh, uh, you know, gave us the opportunity to try to bring up other stories now. And so like Ariana was saying, I definitely want to do a, a film project and also a TV project about Emperor Haile Selassie. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that the short of it would be the TV series would be like The Crown. If you've seen The Crown, the show about the British yeah. monarchy and Queen Elizabeth, we want to do a similar thing for mm. Emperor Haile Selassie to cover his whole life. Um, but the film, because it's a shorter format, uh, we wanted to really focus on a powerful bridge between, uh, as Ariana say, was saying, um, um, Africa and the diaspora. Yeah. And so having this black American pilot coming to Ethiopia, fight alongside his African brothers, and then eventually win this the war against Italy when they were trying mm -hmm. to invade us, we find it's just a powerful story that people will find inspiration in. It's universal. And um, yeah, so now that we have these opportunities, we will start with that, but we definitely want to uh, keep telling powerful stories like that, that people feel inspired and hopeful. 
John Charles Robinson, an African-American aviator and activist, earned the moniker Brown Condor for his remarkable contributions to the Imperial Ethiopian Air Force during its conflict with fascist Italy. A lesser known but pivotal figure in history, Robinson's story is one of courage and commitment. In January 1935, Robinson publicly declared his intention to volunteer in defense of Ethiopia. Uh -huh. What's your age, Mr. Anderson? 37. 37. What is your weight? 150 pounds. Height? Uh, Just a few months later, in April, Emperor Haile Selassie extended an official invitation to him, offering an officer's commission in Ethiopian forces. Robinson's impact was profound. Not only did he actively participate in the conflict, but he also trained numerous Ethiopian pilots. His legacy extends to the establishment of Ethiopian Airlines, a testament to his influence in the field of aviation. He had also become a close friend and advisor to the emperor. Tragically, his life ended in Addis Ababa on March 27, 1954, following injuries from a plane crash. His story, though overshadowed in mainstream history, is a powerful narrative of solidarity and resilience. These types of powerful stories is what Wax and Gold aims to tackle. And it's time these stories are told. እንዲሁም ሀሴት የሚሰጥ አን ነገር ለማድረግ አቅም ይኖረናል በቀስተዳምና የሰላማዊ እንቅልፍን ዋጋ እንረዳለን ለዚህም ነው ቀስተዳምና በእያመቱ በመቶዎች የሚቆጠሩ ፍራሾችን በችግር ላይ ላሉ ወገኖቻችን ጥሩ እንቅልፍ እንዲያገኙ የሚያበረክተው ሲነቁ በሚገባር ፈው እንደሚገኙ እርግጠኞች ነን ቀስተዳምና ሁሉ ሚተሻለ ረፍት እንዲያገኝ ከምን ጊዜውን በላይ ጠንክሮ እየሰራ ነው? አስተዳምና ስፖንጅ ፋብሪካ ግማሽ ሰዓት ዌልኮም ባክ አሪያና ኤንድ ዩዌልስ ዴዲኬሽን ኤክስቴንድስ ቢያንድ ዋክስ ኤንድ ጎልድ So on my side I've been organizing arts events for a long time some with with Meti from Dink mm -hmm. um but yeah I organized a festival in DC called Art All Night which was like a nighttime like a nighttime arts festival um and then now last year I started something called Map Art Foundation which is focused on featuring one artists of the African diaspora every year and we throw like a big exhibition for them. Mm -hmm. Um and so last year was our our first event and yeah it was a mm -hmm. it was like a sold out show in LA at a gallery there. Um so that's one event and then the other maybe is Africon. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah, we connected with a group called Amplify Africa based out of Los Angeles, these two Nigerian guys mm -hmm. who essentially started by uh, throwing uh, uh, parties for, for the African diaspora in LA, um, but they actually grew it into this big festival now that's called Africon. Uh, it's a conference on Africa basically for the African diaspora. Uh, we connected with them and one of the events is Africa Day, which is the founding of the African Union, which as you know, and Prahile Selassie was one of the founders along many other great leaders. Uh, and so uh, they asked me kindly if I would host this event. And um, we did it the first year back in 2022. And it was such a great success. We did it again this year. And so now we become part of this event where every Africa Day, which is May 25th, uh, I will host uh, an evening where we will commemorate 
the African unity uh, that was the spirit of the African Union. Um, and also, obviously, carrying through my grandfather's mm -hmm. legacy of Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we've had a lot of people there. We've had Kweku Mandela come. Uh, we've had a lot of artists um, um, last year. And um, it's something that we want to continue because it's a celebration of African unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, you know, at the core of everything we do now. Speaking of the African Union, the AU was a visionary endeavor championed by Emperor Haile Selassie I. As this institution continues to evolve and make strides in its mission even today, it leads us to ponder, how would the Emperor perceive the current efforts and achievements of the African Union? Would he view them as a fulfillment of his initial vision or see areas where his aspirations have yet to be fully and truly realized? I think he'd be happy it's still continuing, that there's a continuous effort to, to have an African agenda that benefits Africans. Um, I think we've had fits and, and starts with the African Union, a lot of criticism about mm -hmm. it's not as effective as it should be. And especially when we see, you know, a lot of conflicts happening that the African Union was supposed to be the body that could mediate. Indeed, Africa has witnessed considerable conflict and hardship over the years raising questions about the effectiveness of the African Union in mitigating these challenges. This situation prompts a critical examination. Does the African Union still hold a purposeful place in the continent's affairs? Can it truly evolve into a catalyst for change? Or are we destined to see a continuation of the status quo? These questions are vital as we contemplate the future of Africa and the role of the African Union in shaping it. I think this organization is critical and they have uh, some pretty big achievements when you think about the uh, African free trade uh, uh, agreement. But is it being implemented? So I think that's where now people are really eager for it to, to take effect. But I do think um, there, there are plans to, for it to take uh, effect soon. So hopefully we can continue. So we, we can't give up hope, even if sometimes we, we don't hit the mark every time. Uh, it's important that we stay in communication and that we collectively work at our African problems uh, with African solutions. So you kind of mentioned um, that it's good to come back and contribute mm -hmm. to your country. Um, our prime minister recently uh, had a campaign, a call out for second generation Americans to come back and uh, move back to their country and contribute. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's a good call, obviously. I mean you know, regardless of the politics and how you feel about our current situation, I think we can all agree that we all have a part to play in coming mm -hmm. to our home country and, and contributing. Um, so I, I support that and I think it's a great idea. Um, one thing I would add is, as a suggestion to, to this idea, I think it, it cannot be complete without painting the picture of what it means when you do come back. Mm. Um, you know, uh, people need uh, incentives, and also an understanding of how it's going to be once they are here. So I think that uh, to make the idea more fulsome, uh, it would be interesting to see what kind of uh, opportunities there would be. Because uh, I know that people, including myself, uh, I've always uh, an eye towards Ethiopia and want to do something here. And I've had the opportunity now to come here at the hotel and, and you know, continue the the work that my family has done for the, to continue the hotel and, and mm. move it forward. Uh, but I know that some of my friends might not, or, or people I know don't. So what kind of um, situation would they find themselves when they come here? Are there going to be tax-free zones for entrepreneurs who want to start a business? Uh, if somebody wants to come here and work, what kind of career opportunities with the government or with, you know, uh, private sector? Mm. Uh, I think just the, the painting the full picture will give people uh, uh, not only the you know, obviously there's the sentimental part that I think that people will answer the call and come back to their country for just because it's in their heart. But then also just in actuality, what would they be able to do? So I support it fully. I, I wait to hear uh, more details on that. And I actually agree with you. The incentive is very important. And I would add to that and making it, making sure the government understands how to make living here easy. Right, mm. cutting down on bureaucracy, mm. cutting down mm, yeah. on so many things that makes it very difficult for Ethiopians who have moved back to actually stay here. Because mm. we hear stories of people coming from abroad and having such a hard time, they move back. Absolutely, especially if you talk about the diaspora who have come from uh, the Western countries in Europe or in America, uh, you know, there you just have an idea 
in 24 hours, you can apply, get a you know a business registration mm -hmm. and start. Uh, and I think that a lot of people would be looking for that and would be uh, discouraged if you come here and, you know, I mean, obviously some part you have to just adjust. This is a different country. Uh, we have a different culture and a different approach to work and, and other things. Uh, but I do think you're right that if uh, the bureaucracy can kind of uh, slow down all of the ambition that people have, um, they might give up and, and go back. But I think that there were initiatives that had started to make ease of business better. Uh, I haven't heard where that went, but I, I do think it's an important part too. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Well, Like if you, you know, it's great to invite people back and people are already invested. They want to return. They want to do something to contribute and build the country up. So that, you know, that chance is already there, that opportunity. But giving people practical solutions for, you know, what they can do when they're here and how they can contribute and offering them some support in some ways, um, I think would go a long way. In the heart of our journey, a profound question echoes through the ages. Why do we settle for mediocrity? Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Africans, isn't it time to rise to transcend beyond the confines of narrow-mindedness. The soul of Ethiopia yearns for the moment we cease to burden our brothers and sisters, making their pursuit of life and prosperity an uphill battle. Once, our spirit was kindled with unity and compassion. We weren't strangers to empathy. Yet, as time unfolded, it seems we've strayed, embittered by the years. The challenge before us is daunting. Africa, our motherland, grapples with a venomous cycle that has ensnared Ethiopia in its grip. Can we reverse the tide? Is it possible to reclaim the essence of our forebears? To eradicate the bureaucratic quagmire that methodically stifles our nation's vitality generation after generation? History whispers of emperors who dared to confront this specter, yet faltered before its immense shadow. But let us not dwell on the past with sorrow. The dawn of reform beckons, promising a resurgence of hope. With bold, swift reforms, we stand on the precipice of change, not just for ourselves, but for the generations that will follow. This is our beacon of hope, our pledge for a brighter future. Together, we can redefine the legacy of Ethiopia igniting a flame of progress that will illuminate the path for all of Africa. Let this be our vow, our collective aspiration to inspire, to transform, and to heal the heart of our nation. Shifting our focus to a lighter yet equally significant topic, I was curious about the future of the historic Wabi Shebele Hotel. I asked Prince Yoel about the royal family's plans for his cherished landmark. How do they intend to continue its legacy and ensure its preservation as a key piece of Ethiopia's heritage? We are very intent on keeping it going. Um, obviously, it's um, it's a it's an older hotel, so it needed a lot of upkeep and maintenance. But uh, I think it has that that charm of the old Ethiopia, the imperial Ethiopia. You know, um, Wabi Shebele and. Uh, Hilton Hotel were the two, only two major four-star hotels in, in, in Addis at the time. Mm -hmm. And Wabi Shabele actually stood the tallest with 11 floor um, building uh, overseeing the whole of Addis Ababa. So it's a beautiful property, it's a beautiful place. Um, and obviously the emperor was someone who had a vision for the country mm -hmm. and um, uh, bringing in moder modernity and, and, and making a place welcoming for people from outside the country and people within too uh, was a big part of it. So it is part of his legacy that we want to continue. Uh, it's a tie for our family to, you know, stay together and work mm -hmm. on something together. Um, and it's just a, a, a just full of beautiful memories you know ethio jazz really was was a big uh part of the wabi shabale at the time in the mm. 60s uh and so this was a home for ethio jazz that is something we want to also bring back uh just a lot of memories and just keeping the spirit and a connection to that history in our conversation rich with discussions about african stories and african narratives i posed a thought-provoking question to prince yoel with the mirage of challenges that africa faces is storytelling really a worthwhile pursuit? 
Are there not more pressing issues to address? Or could storytelling be an underappreciated method for tackling our complex problems and shedding light on lesser known aspects of African life and culture? Storytelling uh, is critical, it's very important. And like you said, it might seem intangible and in saying, no, we actually need buildings and roads. Yes, we need those too. But the truth is there's so much power in media and in stories. It's the way that uh, you will carry yourself, your people will carry yourself, how your society will will carry itself and how um, people will perceive you. And all of those things can be openings or barriers to you. So I do think it's very important to tell our stories and, and especially in a powerful way. Um, and my hope is that um, here, uh, they, along the lines of what you were saying of um, the ease of doing business, there should be also an ease of uh, coming here and um, doing film, uh, telling the stories of Ethiopia. Now obviously we're talking about some historical big stories uh, about the emperor and, uh, and the monarchy, uh, but there's also plenty of stories. With, uh, you know, uh, I've seen some great films out of here mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that talk about um, different parts of the country and different stories. So I hope that the government will find it a worthy investment because it's very powerful. And I do believe that this administration has been more favorable to uh, uh, mediatizing Ethiopia, so to speak, you know, being a, a window to the world to show how uh, uh, the beauty of our country. To show a positive light. A positive light, media. absolutely. And attract people to come here for tourism, for investment, to come visit. Uh, so I hope that that will happen. I, I think in the beginning of um, uh, the Prime Minister's tenure in 2018, I had heard that there was um, um, some initiative to, to create a film commission and, and have tax incentives. So I hope that that's uh, still uh, very much on their priority because uh, a lot of us, and including uh, people that I know in the States too, would love to come shoot here. Mm -hmm. um, and Ethiopia could be a great location for that. Um, and, you know, that can only be have a positive effect in the end. And that concludes my enriching conversation with this amazing couple, who not only represent Ethiopian royalty, but also embody a sense of collective African pride. Throughout our conversation, it was clear to me that they are part of the future generation Africa so desperately needs. They are a legacy in themselves, highly educated, united by a shared passion for giving back to Africa through philanthropy, vibrant events, and most importantly, through the telling of rich, empowering black stories. I am immensely grateful for the opportunity to have spoken to both Yoel and Ariana. Their dedication is a testament to what can be achieved when dedication, heritage, and ambition converge. I eagerly anticipate witnessing the continued impact of this dynamic duo. What truly sets Yoel and Ariana apart is their commitment to sharing and nurturing a kingdom of prosperity for all. My name is Yadego Absalom. You're watching Good Mashat. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, have a good one. Apart from being one of the emperor's grandsons, who were you in 1974? I graduated from military academy Sandhurst in 71 and then returned back to Ethiopia and joined the third military division of the Imperial Army. And I was active in the military and I was also active amongst the people. The province that I was sent was my father's, uh, he was governor of uh, Hara. And I was sent particularly there because uh, to uh, the people uh, and the military uh, that would be a very good place for me to stay. So you were not only an officer? No, I had uh, both responsibilities of in military clothing I was uh, a lieutenant, in civilian I was still a prince and the people considered me if they had problems to come to me and I would take the same problem then to my grandfather and find some solutions. 
What did you do when the changes took place? I was sent out for military uh, training, advanced military training. Uh, so I got married in April of 74 and then left the country. And what did you do after you left the country? Well, I was uh, in the United States uh, for a military course. And as soon as I heard the, uh, when they deposed my grandfather, I left uh, military school and tried to be uh, involved in the problems in Ethiopia and uh, resigned from the army. What are your activities now, 12 years later, and where? Well, I am trying to find solution uh, of how to make uh, changes amongst the people as well as amongst the military. There has to be a bridge between the two in order to make uh, uh, real changes. And there have been a lot of political parties that have uh, started but haven't uh, set a goal of what they want to do. And you think you could be the man who could put all these forces together? In the future, I still have uh, a role to play in Ethiopia. The fact that you are the emperor's grandson doesn't hamper your action. It is an advantage uh, rather than a disadvantage because the people still believe in our family and I believe that that bridge can be, uh, that it helps rather than becoming an obstacle. Why did you choose the United States? Basically, uh, for security. Uh, I was in Europe uh, for a year, and there had been some team of the military government who were trying to assassinate me. And I chose the United States to be a secure place. Would you be ready to sit on a throne? I exclude myself. There are a lot of members of uh, the family who are still young and who are still in school. Uh, that have no bias, you know, they are, who are unbiased uh, to uh, political ideas. I would say the first five to ten years, uh, one has to set a direction to which the country has to travel, uh, because right now uh, uh, there is anarchism in Ethiopia. So we have to get back to the foundation of our aims, and then towards that work uh, a demo, you know, find democratic uh, parties that will help get that direction. And how could you put an end to the uh, guerrilla movements asking for liberation such as Eritrea and Tigray? Uh, I believe that will solve itself uh, once this government has been you know, uh, overthrown, simply because uh, for the last 12 years both the military as well as the guerrillas have been fighting and uh, there seems to be no end to the fighting. I believe that if you uh, stopped the, the fighting by asking for ceasefire and then sitting down at a round table and working out the problem rather than fighting, uh, I think there will be uh, a solution for it. I think both sides are tired of uh, the war. Thank you very much.